Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to get started. If you can all please take your seats. My name is Christina Alney, and I am the Director of Government Relations of the Victims of Communist Memorial Foundation. On behalf of our organization and the Uyghur Human Rights Project, I would like to thank you all for being here for this very timely briefing. The Ordeal of a Uyghur County, Case Records of Mass Detention. The Chinese Communist Party's campaign of cultural genocide has swept millions into detention separated families, attacked the cornerstones of Uyghur faith and identity, and led to the establishment of a high-tech Orwellian police state. The China cables leave absolutely no room for doubt about what the Chinese Communist Party is doing in the Uyghur region and what it intends to do to them in future. I would now like to turn it over to Omer Kanat, Executive Director of the Uyghur Human Rights Project, who will speak in more depth about the groundbreaking analysis that UHRP has just released today. Thank you, Omer. Thank you, Christina. We are very pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with the victims of communism, an important champion of human rights, and a great uh, friend to the Uyghur people. The document that we are talking about today is the, at least uh, the fourth set of leaked government documents related to Uyghur crisis. We at the UHRP which, uh, wish to pay tribute to the individuals who took great risks uh, in uh, sending these documents to the outside world. They knew they would face terrible punishment if caught, but they took the risk anyway. We honor their sense of responsibility to history and their help in exposing and stopping these human rights crimes. And Uyghurs in exile also face a terrible choice. If they pass along documents they receive and or speak out and explain what they know, they fear their families will face reprisals. UHRP has documented the ongoing uh, threats against the Uyghur American family in East Turkestan in our recent report uh, of uh, repression across borders. But these threats have not silenced it. One example is Asia Abdullahad, a Uyghur woman in the Netherlands who has helped journalists access and understand leaked government documents. As she has said, if we keep silent to try to protect our families, then who will act to end this nightmare? And today we will have also uh, we will also hear from another Uyghur in exile, <coughs> Abdulwadi Ayub, whose family has also suffered tremendously. This morning, UHRP released its report on the Karakash document called "Ideological Transformation: Case Records from Karakash Hotel." The Karakash document provides clear confirmation of the truthfulness of eyewitness and survivor testimony. It also provides clear confirmation of other Orwellian police state operations in East Turkestan. 
In, uh, that includes the integrated joint operations platform, data collection program, cadres living in Uyghur homes through the Becoming Family program, forced labor, and punishment of two-faced Uyghurs. All these policies and operations are openly referenced in the case records. Governments and the UN must act now to end this nightmare. UHRP is also urgently calling for international intervention because of a new threat, the threat of coronavirus spreading in the detention camps and forced labor facilities. Xinjiang University has delayed the start of the spring semester until further notice to prevent infections. But the government has not said a single word about closing the camps to prevent deadly epidemic. We know that prisoners are in very poor health, face overcrowded conditions, and rarely have water. Last week, UHRP sent letters to U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Serv Services, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and the World Health Organization. We are calling for immediate international intervention to save lives. Since then, equally horrifying news is coming out of East Turkestan regarding inhumane quarantine policies. Several sources report that whole neighborhoods were suddenly blocked off with no warning. People did not have time to stock up on food. This happened about 10 days ago, and new messages are sounding the alarm that people will have no food left. We fear ex extreme consequences if nothing is done. UHRP is making an emergency appeal for food supplies to be delivered to the people who did not have time to stock up for the quarantine. Finally, I want to urge the U.S. Congress to pass, pass the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. Earlier versions of this bill passed in unanimously by Senate in September and by the House in uh, December 2019. It's time to pass the bill into law. <clears throat> there is no time to be lost. Thank you. Now I will uh, turn the program over to UHRP's uh, Director of Global Advocacy, Louisa <coughs> Greva. Thank you, Omer. Uh, welcome to all, again to all our guests and to all those who are watching uh, on the streaming, live streaming of our event. Thank you. Uh, we will go ahead with our, our panelists presenting their research and analysis. Each panelist will speak 10 to 15 minutes, a little longer if uh, they need the time. And then we will have time for comments and questions at the end. Uh, we will begin with Adrian Zenz. Uh, as you know, he is a senior fellow in China's China Studies at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, uh, and he supervises PhD students uh, at the European School of Culture and Theology at Korntal in Germany. Uh, his research focuses on China's ethnic policy in both Tibet uh, and the Uyghur region. Uh, he's authored several monographs and, as you know, many influential research articles on the Uyghur crisis, uh, many of which are published in the Journal of Political Risk. Adrian, will you accept bring will you lead us off? Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I have brought a PowerPoint which will probably come up shortly. Yesterday, a leaked document has been published by a whole range of uh, media publications, uh, as well as UHRP and myself, titled The Karakash List, um, a 137-page PDF document specifically focusing on people interned in the county of Karakash in Hotan Prefecture in southern Xinjiang. And I'm 
just going to pause a little bit because I need to show a picture. The technology at this event is sponsored by Huawei. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're having a problem with intercepting the data, and that's why we're being held up. No, I could just email it to them directly, and they wouldn't have to worry about it. So. <laughs> I'm waiting two laptops. This one belongs to the Chinese government, and this one is my own. <laughs> briefly outlining the structure of the new leaked document. This is page one of 137. You see on the leftmost the number of rows. The document has 667 data rows. Many of them are representing duplicate identities, but different uh, ver verdicts. And therefore, uh, the total, in total, the document has the identities of nearly 3,000 Uyghur adults and 311 unique primary individuals represented by each data row. You see in the first couple of columns, well, it's hard to see, I guess, but you see the internment camp that they are detained in for re-education. These are all uh, what we can call vocational training internment camps, which are only one of a number of different forms of internment. I'm going to keep track of time, too, for, okay, this one has a, has a clock, because otherwise you might miss your flights back home. Okay, <clears throat> the date of the internment, their names, ID numbers, where they're registered, the reasons for internment, and then uh, the widest middle column that is uh, the biggest visible has their, fam their three circles. Firstly, their family circle over three generations. You have parents, you have children, you have uh, relatives. Uh, etc. Then you have a social or neighborhood circle, and then you have information about the religious inheritance circle, a very rarely used term. So this document is revealing some fairly internal um, data that is not commonly uh, found on official government websites. It's even very uncommon in internal government documents. Uh, some of the terminology used in this document is in fact not found anywhere else. So very interesting. And the data in the middle column is really used to assess and evaluate whether these persons should be released or not. The actual text of the verdict uh, of release or non-release is in the rightmost column over there. So this is the basic structure of the document. Overall statistics, we have 656 persons in some form of internment or prison, representing 23.5% of 2,800 individuals. Uh, the 2,800, I would say, is not a precise total count, because over a 1,000 of these individuals do not have ID numbers. They're only identified by name and age, and some of them would be double counted. But about 27 to 2800 adults plus uh, several hundred minors under the age of 18, which we have not counted for uh, the purpose of computing an adult internment share. Of these, 4.9% or 137 are, have been sentenced to prison terms. Um, 42 are in detention centers, and the others are in the vocational training internment camps. So these are the basic statistics. You can tell it's very extensive personal information. <clears throat> Quite interesting is the internment over time. This pertains to the um, 311 primary individuals. Oh yes, I need to. Oh my goodness, I didn't do this. 
<laughs> and Chinese, I thought the Chinese, they, they control this computer and, and they do it, but they didn't. I don't know, the Chinese are sleeping, sorry. Okay, so I have to do both computers. I'm very sorry. So these are all the numbers I just explained. They're for you again. And this is the chart I'm talking about. So this shows over time and basically it confirms that the internment campaign really kicked off in uh, April 2017, which is the first of the slightly taller bars. The, the biggest peak was in May 2017, you see there. There was another peak in October, uh, September, October 2017, and then far over to the right, another one in the spring of 2018, most notably in May 2018. So, um, which is quite interesting because in the first half of 2018 is when a lot of these camps were significantly enlarged in size. So very interesting data. <clears throat> Reasons for internment, these were coded by myself uh, because obviously they're all over the place. Uh, and one person could have more than one reason for internment listed. So you have multiple counts here. Violation of birth control policies uh, is the number one reason stated, often though not by itself. Uh, this, I think, rarely was a reason, a standalone reason for internment, typically cited alongside other reasons. The general category of untrustworthy, Bu Fang Xin, is the second highest. This is a catch-all category that was much more frequently just mentioned by itself. Um, almost 70 or 80 percent of the, of the over 100 uh, instances where this was mentioned as a reason of the internment, no other reason was given. So we're looking at a generic demographic um, reason for internment as the government is concerned especially about persons under the age of 40. The reason for that is obvious. Um, acts of violent resistance were mainly committed by these age groups. These age groups are uh, considered more susceptible to influence the, the younger generation. The third one is religion related in a wider sense, contain all kinds of religion related reasons then linked to anything abroad, this could be um, either they've communicated to somebody abroad using an illegal uh, communication app, or they are relatives of persons abroad, or they themselves have gone abroad and returned, or in quite a few instances they applied for a passport without ever leaving the country. Formerly detained persons come next. Persons who used to be in detention in the past are perennially suspect, it's like a vicious cycle. Once you are suspect, you're always suspect. Then you get put into the camp because you're suspect. And if you've been in the camp, you're even more suspect than when you were before. And anyone who associates with you is also suspect. And it just goes on and on and on. It's like an endless cycle of suspicion because there's no trust. The system is not based on trust. Um, and so on. Uh, just briefly, Religion-related reasons we can break down also by age. You have age categories down there. Sorry, Beijing is still, they're, they're still, they're still in the middle of the night. They're not operating this computer. Okay, age starts 20 to 24 years, 25. These are five-year age cohorts going from 20 uh, to 65 plus. <coughs> and it's mainly 45 years and above that over 60% of persons in that age group have some religion-related reason for their original internment uh, stated. And I think one of the reasons for that is a lot of the younger ones are simply in the untrustworthy category. Mm -hmm. And the untrustworthy category is also largely effectively related to religion, but it's not directly stated. So if you had the same chart for untrustworthy, it's the inversion. You have mostly persons under 40. The main reason, apparently, of this document, even though it's not stated in the title as such, is all of the data in all of the columns points towards the, the verdict, whether somebody should be released or not. That's the main point of this document uh, in terms of its own internal data. And quite interestingly, this document, interestingly enough, represents the strongest piece of evidence that we have that uh, a lot of the persons in the vocational training camps are being or have been released. Which makes sense, 
because these camps are not permanent uh, in the sense, well, they're permanent structures, but they're not there to intern people long term. That's what prisons are there for. So one, this is important. one batch of the Uyghur population has been sentenced to prison. The other batch is still stuck in other forms of detention or in the um, justice system training schools, in the transformation through education, in many other extra legal uh, structures that we have. The vocational training camps are kind of like the bottom rung if you have if you've done better. They are, they are actually, they are essentially a route to be released into forced labor, release uh, into unfreedom. Um, and this is what the data bears out, 74% release of all forms. But for 13%, a very common verdict is also, well, they should finish their minimum one year of re-education. So effectively, the release rate is closer to uh, 85 or 90%. Only 12.5% are explicitly said to have to continue studying. Which, of course, doesn't say anything about the camps being filled with new people. These are existing people. So it's entirely possible also the nightlight data that we have. A lot of camps actually don't have a lot of decrease in light. Also the, the four camps in Karakaks don't have, don't have a lot of light, um, don't have a lot of nightlight decrease to measure the activity. So these camps are not closed down. Um, we have the data for persons who were interned mostly in 2017 and 18. What's happening now in these camps, we have very little idea. Are they pushing new people through these camps? Entirely possible. Okay. <clears throat> trying to now take a step back from the document and trying to see what can it tell us? What is the bigger picture that comes from all this? The document <coughs> tells us like no other piece of data that uh, Xinjiang's internment campaign is very labor intensive, and that it's based on detailed investigation. It's based on detailed reasons for internment, although many of them are very generic, but still, there can be very detailed appraisals of individuals. So the, the, the state has not simply scooped up hundreds of thousands and millions of people. It has put a lot of work into gathering information on them within its own worldview. <clears throat> this groundwork, this investigative groundwork, has, we can surmise, and by comparison with the categories used by other, from other secondary documents, been largely on the shoulders of the village-based work teams, the Fang Hui Ju in Chinese, Fang Hui Ju Gong Zhe Dui, the, the, the village-based work teams, which were launched in 2014 by Zhang Chunxian. Chen Quan was a predecessor. And um, if we look at the timing of the internment campaign, you see the Chinese New Year period for each year. Uh, the original uh, work team campaign ran from 2014 to 16. And then the, the send-off day, there's like a send-off, a, a regional send-off ceremony for sending off the work teams into the villages after Chinese New Year, typically. And the full deployment, by when, when they're supposed to be fully deployed. The full deployment is the rightmost date, typically early March or late February. Now, in 2017, Chen Quan simply continued what had happened the previous three years. Uh, Chen Quan extended the village work team project indefinitely. Initially, it was limited for three years, and Chen Quan said, this is becoming a long-term mechanism, and it's still ongoing. <clears throat> so, March 1st was the full deployment, March 1st, 2017. The full deployment of the village-based work teams, and we all know that the internment campaign started in late March, early April, and had a peak in the summer. Now that's telling us something, isn't it? So Chen's strategy in Xinjiang, there's some possibility that something significant happened in March 2016 at the two sessions in Beijing, because that is the one time that we know for sure that Zhang Chunxian, uh, the party secretary of Xinjiang before Chen, Chen Quanguo himself, who is now the party secretary of Xinjiang, 
I, I should have explained that earlier, and Xi Jinping, China's president, were all three in the same place. And um, of course, that's possible when they, that they made some plans back then, because um, from my analysis, it really looks like Chen Quanbo hit the ground running. He really, really hit the ground running when he came to Xinjiang in August 2016. He lost no time, really no time. He was busy. And the strategy is that between August 2016 and early 2017, those six, seven months, he firstly securitized. He applied the securitization strategy that he had rolled out in Tibet, police stations, police surveillance systems. And that was a pre-requirement pre of the internment campaign, right? You don't want to scoop up a huge amount of the population and risk public resentment without turning the place into a real police state. So this had to come before the internment campaign to, to make sure that the government had full control and nobody could resist the internment. Secondly, it took some time to wrap up the evaluation of the village work team campaign. Traditionally, the village work team campaign each year had an evaluation time and then a relaunch time with new requirements, and the party secretary would state new requirements. How am I doing with time? Oh dear. Okay. <clears throat> I need to be faster. So anyways, this sort of untimely succession time in August indicates that, in my opinion, that Zhang Chunqian was cut off before at his time, and Chen was brought in strategically. The focus then in a very important January 7 speech was on the iron discipline for cadres, and then the internment campaign started. So, <clears throat> my argument is that Chen was more an innovator, uh, was an innovator in Tibet, but in Xinjiang he was not as much an innovator, he was a manager. He, he was charged with upscaling the existing mechanisms, because Xinjiang already had under Zhang Chunquan already had mechanisms for identifying uh, re-education targets, such as the village work teams, already had re-education procedures, and already had a system of dedicated institutions. So all that Chen needed to do was to bring in the policing and police state experience and upscale the re-education system dramatically. And that required managerial skills, especially iron discipline among the cadres. So very new interesting arguments can be made from, this is all based on research of the Karakash list, the new document. So to conclude, <clears throat> the future strategy of Beijing and Xinjiang is based on ongoing social control and the ongoing evaluation. The document notes that uh, those, a lot of the verdicts in the document says people can continue to be in release or continue to be employed as opposed to having to return. In the first year of having been released from a vocational internment camp, people are supposed to be closely followed by the authorities and evaluated on a regular basis. That's what also the China cable said before in November. And you see exactly that in a Karakash document. You see, is allowed, people are said to be allowed to permit it to continue to be released. Right. Everybody in Xinjiang is on probation. So I think this will continue. I, I'm not sure that they will stop this after one year. Everybody in Xinjiang is on probation and could be re-interned or newly interned in a camp. Controlling people on location through work teams, police surveillance. So the next really uh, mechanism of control, as at least some of the camps are emptying out, not all of the camps are emptying out. One type of camp for sure is getting more empty. Um, People are being controlled where they live. Yeah. They're almost being interned where they live. Mandatory labor is part of that, and highly controlled by environments. This is also where new urban settlements come in. This is one example in Karakash. This big blue roofed area was built in the middle of 2018. It had fences around, high fences around every single building that was removed later on. And further up in the top of the picture, you see new urban settlements. So I think this is probably, this is a part of the future of Beijing's rule in over the weekends. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. Tremendous. Um, we will next hear from Abdulwali Ayub. Uh, he's a Uyghur linguist who's 
come to Washington from Norway, where he has found political asylum. Uh, he's currently a fellow with the International Cities of Refuge Network. He's not a stranger to the US, however. He got his master's degree here at the University of Kansas in 2011. This is his first visit back uh, in over eight years. After he got his master's degree, he returned to China with a, with a wish to uh, preserve the Uyghur language and work with his people. He promoted social and cultural rights through the promotion of Uyghur language education, uh, imprisoned himself, a former political prisoner, in 2013 to 2014, um, probably a very good example of the pre-existing mechanisms of arbitrary detention and re-education systems that Adrian was just uh, discussing. UHRP has published uh, an in-depth report on the entire movement for Uyghur mother tongue education and Abdul Abdul uh, role in that, and he has been uh, very involved in the analysis of this document. So please welcome him to the podium. Who mentioned the document, and uh, 
they helped me to uh, verify the document. For example, that like uh, after I translated the document, nobody knows the places because they changed it. The, after uh, 2017, uh, the local government changed the place names. They changed the place name. For example, that uh, this is uh, Karaklash. They uh, for, before uh, we have um, township. But uh, in 2017, uh, they change, uh, they divide Karkash for uh, five district. And uh, in this document, it mentioned it, it's Chinese. And when, we talk, when, we, when I talk to the people that, are you from the number one district? Are you from number two district? Is it, what are you talking about? What's this? And I need to ask people that this, uh, like the number one district is this, number two district is this, and, uh, and uh, it's uh, like on um, satellite image, I showed them and I said, oh, we don't call this. We call it with the original name. This is the big challenge for us, and uh, after that I uh, like, um, found the original names and uh, met with the document. Um, yeah, uh, in that document uh, mentioned uh, four, uh, five uh, re-education camp. Uh, one number one, it's this one, and number uh, two, uh, and number th number two and number three. And this uh, number one is very interesting that it's in Bostankul Industrial District. Uh, after this, I asked uh, different people from Kashgar, from uh, Korda. They told me the same fact that uh, those re-education camps are in industrial zone. And why it's in industrial zone? It's because I think uh, it's because of they want to transform those people to forced labor. That's why they deliberately arrange those uh, re-education camps in industrial zone. It's another fact that number two, number two uh, re-education camp are um, in, um, it's very close to a train station. And why it's very close to train station? Because they want to like make it as a factory. It's easy to transport. Uh, transport. And I asked, uh, I interviewed another three Uyghur from Kashgar. They told me that the, uh, one of the internment camp in Kashgar is in Kashgar train station. It's the same with the uh, education camp in Kashgar, in uh, Kar uh, Karabash. This is the age, uh, Adrian already talked about it. This is also the age. And let me talk about this. Um, this is number Yes, this is number one, the re-education camp. It's the satellite image. It's very interesting that, like, uh, number one re-education camp, uh, this is the one. The another one is detention center. Uh, depend on the list, we can find that people, they always try, like, uh, send people from uh, detention center to re-education camp, from re-education camp to detention center. That's why they build the same place. It's easy to move people. Because in the re-education camp, there are um, persecution and court and the police office. They interrogate at the same place, and then persecution work on them, and then send them to the prison. It's very close from uh, re-education camp to detention center. And another fact that number three detention center depend on the like um, document we can tell that number three detention center also the prison. Uh, three uh, detainees uh, mentioned in the document that they are fushing. They are like having their prison life in that detention center, number three detention center. It means that number three detention center at the same time, re-education camp and the prison. Uh, this is satellite image of the sensors. Um, it one thing oh, I need to make uh, clear 
that uh, uh, number two, number state nation center, I think. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, in 2008, until 2008 March, the number uh, three detention center is here. And in 2008, about March, they moved the detention center is here. I asked this, uh, the people from Karkash. They, uh, one of them visited the Karkash a uh, few weeks ago, and one of them visited in Karkash in 2018, at that time, March, and his father-in-law detained the state number three eradication camp. And he told me that they, they moved. Originally, it's here, and in 2008, 2018, I'm sorry, 2018, they, uh, Change it that to this place number A from B to A. And uh, uh, there is a duplication. Uh, uh, Adrian already wrote in his uh, reports, but he didn't he didn't have time to talk about that. About duplication, there we have a lot of duplication. It's uh, originally it's uh, six hundred sixty-seven the detainees. But the real number is uh, 314. And why we have this du duplication? I think it's because of, uh, like in China, it's very popular thing that uh, lower level government always cheat the upper level government. There is several amount of people you have to arrest. But there is no enough people. What can we do it? Duplicate the number. And then they can report that, oh, we arrested 600. But at the end, no. And another thing that, in this document, another like fraudulent that uh, like uh, 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 more than 10 detainees, the former detainees after they release it, they found a job in uh, like uh, gold industry, gold service. But it's interesting, in um, like uh, after this mass arresting, uh, in Karkash, uh, people, like I can uh, show you the pictures, and the, the, the street is empty and nobody get married. Depend on Uyghur culture, we buy, we buy uh, gold for wedding. Nobody get wedding. Who can buy those golds? Who can find job those gold smiths industry? It's impossible. They're just cheating the upper level government that we educated them, and they already found the job in gold education, like gold smith, something like that. And another thing that, one example is very interesting, that. Uh, one Uyghur, Habibullah, he has clinic in Karkash before, he, before the arrestment. After the arrestment, the document said that he found the job in, like, um, Khogodian. It's, um, yeah, it's... Hot pot soups. Hot pot, yeah. How could that be possible, like, a clinic, the doctor, medical doctor, and at the end, after education, he found the job in, like, the, the, the restaurant. Another thing, it's interesting that another lady, who educated the re-education camp, uh, and after that, after he released, he found the job at the same place. And I can show you the picture, uh, that Khogodian, uh, that place. It's very small, and it, it doesn't need two Uyghur to run this. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the document tells us that this duplication is because of the lower level government needs to uh, tell, report their, like, uh, something, and then they create something, uh, like, very um, uh, illogical. And I, do I have time? Yeah. Uh, I want to explain something, for example, that, like, um, in, uh, depend on the Adrian's uh, uh, article that uh, the first reason is family planning. Um, I interviewed the people about this topic, why this family planning is like the main reason of the people who are being arrested. Uh, in 2016, uh, about uh, November, yes, and uh, the, the local Shuji local secretary, party secretary of uh, Hotem, he gave a speech to uh, with officials in Hotem. He told that why we have so many people uh, like uh, don't follow the family planning. 
it's not only don't follow the family planning, it's the kind of resistance. It's the kind of peaceful resistance, like voiceless resistance. It's symbol of you are not following the Chinese law, we are not Chinese anymore, so we are not going to follow your law. That's why they think that it's a very serious problem. For example, that this family planning is uh, implementing in China, but like it's uh, in China, it's everywhere. Nobody strictly follow the family planning. But if Uyghur, they don't follow the family planning, it becomes something resistance. That's why they like, depend on my interview from people from Hoten and people from Kashgar, like I interviewed five and they told me that like, uh, especially the guy who came uh, from uh, Hoten in 2017 May, he told me that he participated the conference and that uh, leader told that it's not only family planning issue, it's a political issue. They are not following the Chinese law, it means that they don't, they don't admit themselves as Chinese. So they're breaking our law deliberately. This is the uh, first one, second. On transport issue, after like uh, in this uh, document, uh, always repeated that like uh, people born after uh, uh, 1980s and 1990s and 2000, it's untrustworthy. Why are they untrustworthy? We received the um, uh, document in uh, 2018 about May, and it's a voice document. Uh, it tells that like uh, uh, our uh, Yalkun Rosi, he arrested because of he uh, compiled the textbook of Uyghur uh, in Uyghur language for Uyghur kids, Uyghur children, Uyghur students. And uh, like uh, in that uh, uh, voice conference uh, tells us that like after to, after uh, uh, 1980s and 1990s and 2000, and those Uyghur textbooks used uh, more than three million Uyghurs reached those Uyghur textbooks. And those three million Uyghurs are, in, are not trustworthy because of they use the textbook, the old, the, the old textbook, and it's, it's emphasized Uyghurness, Uyghur identity. So that's why they are uh, untrustworthy because they use those textbooks compiled by Yalkuruzi and other Uyghur intellectuals. Mm -hmm. And um, it's location. Uh, Fang Huiji. Uh, Adrian just talked about the Fanghuiji. It's uh, started with uh, in 2013. Um, I visited Fanghuiji. I visited in uh, uh, Yelsa County. I visited uh, seven times, and uh, those uh, folks is to um, understand the local uh, people's religious and ethnic identity. Like uh, one by one, those uh, cadre uh, visited the people one by one, asked how many times you pray, how many times you like make dua after eating, and uh, how many book do you have about Uyghur history, how many book about, uh, like, uh, about religion, and have you visited religious websites, something like that. Oh, I forget another thing. Like uh, this document uh, showed that the term uh, uh, what is this Duan In 2016, uh, September 13, uh, Chen uh, he had a conference. He uh, ordered to um, stop phone, stop the phone numbers who connected with outside. And then, uh, when your cell phone stopped, you have to go to the uh, like uh, telephone company, and telephone company asks you that you have to go to police first and then you can re restore your, your cell phone. And you, can, you go to police, and the police will arrest you. Because of this, this is Duan Tolian, it is like started 2016, uh, September uh, 13. It's to, Duan Tolian means this. Like, at that time, some of them arrested, some of them not. But uh, in 2017, just earlier mentioned, it's in uh, May, it's another peak. That's why, because at the time, the people did not arrest it in 2016, September, they arrested in 2017. 
like uh, another thing that uh, not the app, it, this the document also mentioned, Quaya, this app, and in uh, like dependent on the first document released in, uh, two thousand, uh, like November two thousand nineteen, November twenty fourth, it's it tells that uh, more than one hundred eighty seven thousand Uyghur downloaded that app, and those Uyghur are under this Lentonian, under this this this, this uh, like um, under the list of. Uh, untrustworthy because they downloaded the Quaya app and they, they tried to connect it outside. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. And it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague at the Uyghur Human Rights Project, Dr. Elise Anderson. We joke that she's Dr. Dr. Anderson because of her two PhDs, <laughs> dual PhDs in Central Asian, Euro, Central Eurasian Studies and Ethnomusicology from Indiana University, Bloomington. Uh, she, she based her doctoral research on years of on-the-ground research in the Uyghur region. Um, she has focused on the relationship between art and politics, specifically Uyghur music. She speaks Uyghur fluently. I think she may have a few things to say about language uh, in the document, uh, as well as speaking Chinese, uh, and as a practicing musician and dancer. She has worked uh, on the Hill here uh, as the Liu Xiaobo Fellow uh, last summer with the CECC, the Congressional Executive Commission on China, and I'm happy to welcome her to the podium. and um, thank all of you who are here today. I'm going to try to keep my remarks even shorter and snappier than I had planned them because I, I'm sure a lot of you are wanting to ask questions. Um, okay, so let me jump in here. Um, so as you know, we at the UHRP, I was a part of a research team that uh, was fortunate enough, thanks to Abdul Veli and the train of chain of transmission that brought this document to us, we were fortunate enough to have a little bit of time to look over it, look through it, and produce a report on it. I hope some of you have been able to grab that report. You can take it with you when you leave today. Um, I prepared a lot more <laughs> than I'm going to have time to go over and talk about with you, um, but fortunately, some of it repeats things you've already heard today. And also, you might be able to leave here with that report so that you can read it yourselves. So I'll just jump in and uh, kind of go quickly, but as thoroughly as possible through my slides here. So um, we at the UHRP, rather than the Karakash list, uh, labeled this particular document the Karakash document, but we're referring to the same thing as my colleague Adrian, as uh, the media has been. And uh, what we tried to get out in our report is what the implications, some of the implications, of this document are. Um, and one simple way, a very effective way to put it, is that the Karakash document gives us 137 pages of documentary proof that people in East Turkestan are detained or deemed suspicious for legitimate and reasonable actions. And what does that mean? That means that this document helps to verify claims that members of the Uyghur diaspora, that internment camp survivors, and that journalists, reporters, and other researchers have been telling the world about for years. So let's not sort of lose sight of that, right, as we jump into, I don't know, numbers and terminology and all of the details that come out of this document. There's something really fundamental that we can take. Um, so you already, I'll skip over this because you already learned a little bit about what right, this document looks like and what the cells and rows contain. There's a little bit of an English translation of 12 rows of this now floating around out there that you can peruse if you so choose. We've also included it as an appendix in our report if you're interested in looking at that. Um, right, so I had planned to talk a little bit about some of the internees. I, I will stop here just to say, again, not losing sight of some fundamental and basic things. We're talking about a place. Uh, we're talking about a very particular place, the Bostan subdistrict of Karakash County in Khoten Prefecture in East Turkestan, the Uyghur region. 
This is a place populated by real people, right? With lives, families, hopes, dreams. Um, and so I just wanted to pay a little bit of homage to that by reminding us kind of the where we're looking. So here's this one crude map, right? You can see East Turkestan in orange, the Khotan Prefecture in red there. Um, and he, then here, next, we have a Google Earth image of what Karakash County looks like. So I know you probably can't see it well from afar, but in the middle, where you can see that there is some text in white, that's showing you the location of Karakash County next to Khoten City. Um, and this is, I hope, a striking image you will take with you. This is iconic for the Uyghur region, um, these green oases surrounded by this lovely sea, right, <laughs> of sand in the desert. Um, this is Karakash, right? This is part of the place. Uh, in our document, in our report, you can find a little bit of information where you know we break down things like who are the internees by um, by sex, right? Who uh, are the internees based on? what centers they're being sent to. We also, again, to give us a sense of, of place, and think about how these centers, we've included photos of all of these centers, think about how much they contrast to that lovely green oasis, right, that you saw sort of spreading out before you on our Google Earth image. Um, here's that possible location of um, the internment center number two near the tra train station, center number three, center number four. Right? Imagine what it's like to be a person living in this place where centers like this. These are just four in Karakash County. There are undoubtedly more. Um, and think about, I don't know, how invasive that has been for life as those have sprung up. Um, as similar to my colleagues, my esteemed colleagues here, um, Adrian and Abdul Dali, um, we at the UHRP also spent time uh, looking at and trying to kind of categorize and get numbers for different reasons for internment. So you will find tables and charts in our report. You can also, in Appendix 3, see a more extensive list of reasons for internment. So in the body of the report itself, we kind of try to group and scale down, whereas in the appendix, we've, we've given you a more complete range of those things, so it might have research or other value for some of you. Um, and just a few things to highlight. I'll, I'll not spend a lot of time talking about this, but one, as you've already heard from both of my colleagues, um, we also were surprised, in a sense, to see you know family planning or birth, call, birth uh, control policy violations as one of the main reasons for internment. And we don't know exactly why that is. There's not a lot that we can um, beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, sort of give as the reason for why that is. Um, but I, I would just want us all to think about the fact that, you know, we know that people all over China have violated the family planning policy at one point or another over the years, where or when ever in China before right now in the Uyghur region for Uyghurs, probably Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and others, where have people been put into extra judicial and extra legal internment camps for violating family planning policy? Right? Let's, let's keep that in mind. That is something I think that is fundamentally new and fundamentally abhorrent here and important, important for us to keep in mind. Um, I think another thing that's important for us all to take away from the reasons for internment is that there are a lot of um, I don't know, inconsistencies in some way, internally in this document even, that m can make you realize that Uyghurs are damned if they do and damned if they don't. Uh, the people who are being, anyone, whether Uyghur or of another ethnic background, being swept up into this internment campaign is damned if they do and damned if they don't. Some places in the document say, so-and-so had a passport and went abroad and maybe was in one of the 26 forbidden countries or something else, and that's the reason for their internment. Meanwhile, somebody else had a passport but never went abroad, and that made them suspicious, right? That tells you that there's nothing that these large swaths of society, there's nothing that a lot of people in Uyghur society and Karakash society can do not to be suspicious. 
And I think that's a really important takeaway for all of us to keep in mind. Um, so another section of our report um, looks at the extent to which details in this document help to corroborate other policies and other practices, state practices that we know about. So I won't spend a lot of time here, but we, we have referenced um, excellent reporting by the likes of Human Rights Watch on the Integrated Joint Operations Platform, or IJOP, the app for data gather gathering of this Becoming Family Program, um, an excellent article by Dr. Darren Beiler that we referenced there. Um, and there are references to two-faced officials, right, um, that also appear in this document that help to confirm the veracity of details, right, that we know about this and the vast array of reasons the state has found for detaining, interning, or locking people away in prison. Um, and I'll say here, uh, we also have in one section of our report this table where we list the final assessments of um, sort of bureaucrats, right, the low-level government officials who have compiled this document and compiled all of this information. Uh, this show variety, I think Adrian put it well by saying that people, I tried to write it down, um, people get released from internment, but released into unfreedom, right? And if we look at the things that are listed in this table, these assessments or judgments, we can see some of that coming out. So you see a lot of people are released into community management and control. That doesn't sound very free to me. Right? There are also references to working at the park, that's how we chose to translate this, likely the forced labor system that Adrian has done so much to sort of reveal and help us to know about and understand. Um, a lot of people are told, told they have to continue training and so forth, right? So you can read that in more detail in the report, but just, again, I, Adrian put it in a very evocative way. Internees get released into unfreedom. They can end up back in internment at any moment as well. Um, and I'll end by noting that we just had a couple of points for further research that we thought were really interesting and wanted to bring up. Adrian made the point in his presentation that there is some novel terminology in the Karakash document or the Karakash list. And um, one of those includes what we think is probably a method, the name for a method of data gathering and analysis that remarkably returns absolutely no results anywhere online, right? which shows us it's something something internal. And it's, it's called the three circles and six diagrams collision analysis, or san quan liu tu peng zhuang feng qi. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, right, you can see examples in the original Chinese. You can also see them in this little bit of English translation. Right, of this appearing in the way that officials talk about how they've been assessing people's family circles and the things that they've, the, all of the information they've gathered. We don't know exactly what it means, especially what the six diagrams are referring to. This is something that warrants further research. And um, I'm, I was glad to hear Abdul Ali mention this, because kind of administrative restructuring of Qarqash is something we found as well in our research and thought was very interesting that in May of 2017, I believe it was, and this is from a government website, and it's telling us that the government was setting up new management committee committees for different subdistricts and different administrative units. And we can't say a lot about what this means exactly, but we think it's likely not coincidental that uh, the government, the authorities were changing the administrative structure of the region at the same time that the camp program was really starting to, to take off and expand in earnest. And that hints at um, the, the sort of way that the authorities likely have conceived of this campaign as one that encompasses the totality, right, of administration, social life, the organization of the world in the Uyghur region. So I will wrap up my comments there. Um, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to hearing your comments and questions. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Elise. We now do have time for comments and questions. Uh, 
we will be asking our panelists if they'd like to respond to each other, but meanwhile, please think of your questions, uh, and we'll be able to call upon you in a minute. So feel free to raise your hand when you're ready, and I'll be noting down who to call upon. So let me turn to Adrian and Abdullahi and, and Elise to see if there's any response to each other's response, uh, comments. Yes, thank you. I'd like to take the opportunity to briefly um, make some further remarks on the question of also the number of camps in Karakash. Obviously, four camps are mentioned for the primary detainees. Um, further camps are in fact mentioned in the document, one particular township camp. But an even more interesting bit is this document contains remarkable detail that we have not even touched yet. One of them are the multiple ways in which different camps can be named. And one of, this has two implications. One implication is that a person can be identified in the camp, not just by which camp he or she is in, but also by the building number. Camps have building numbers. The larger camps at least have district numbers. They can have different districts, buildings, and class. They're also in class. For example, one person is to be shown in district in, in re-education camp number one, district 12, building six, class 18. So it's like you could almost write them a letter to that thing, although who knows. Okay, the other implication is Karakash at one point, I believe 2000, 16 or something, I have it somewhere, had 12 districts, uh, the whole county. And we have heard that the districts were changed and reorganized, and many new ones were added. <coughs> but re-education camps, or the, the vocational internment camps, are also called number one district camp, meaning that's the camp for district number one. And the document has a number 12 district training center, which indicates that likely there's at least one vocational internment camp for each district in the county. And of course we have prior information that shows that each administrative unit, township level and higher, likely has a camp, at least has a vocational training internment camp. Um, Oftentimes, they also have other forms of camps, right? Because that's only one type of re-education camp. So these are some of the insights the uh, document can give us about the, uh, the camp situation and structure. And just we realize how little we know about all this. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to talk. Uh, actually, uh, there are mentioned the uh, <coughs> Another one, uh, we have like uh, five detainees in Yihuchi. It's medical area. And I interviewed the people, what this medical area? They told me that uh, in every county, we have a hospital. And in every hospital, there is a special place for uh, camp detainees. If you are sick, you cannot uh, stay in a normal like uh, hospital. You have to stay in the camp there, still the every, like, um, in 2016, no, 2017, one of Uyghur scholars died in a Kashtar, Kerambal hospital, and I asked where he died. The, he, he died because of, in, in Kerambal uh, hospital, uh, there is a special place for uh, camp detainees. Uh, it means that in this document, show Yihu Chi, it means that it's the, also the re-education camp, but it's in hospital. And another, like, um, uh, we, in that document, uh, showed uh, 18th uh, village uh, re-education camp. I asked the people, where is it? It's actually the, in a party school of uh, Karakash. Uh, and, then, and then I asked the people from different places. They told me that, for example, that the one uh, from uh, my hometown, like Kashkar uh, Konche, it's Shufushen. And they told me that 
there's a like re-education camp in a party school of my hometown. And in the, the Karpash also, there's a re-education camp in party school. I think like if we study this more and we will find that like every um, party school in our homeland change it to re-education camp. Yeah, thank you. Ready to go to questions? So we have a question um, back here, Max. You know, the mic will come if yes. you can give your name and affiliation. Thank you. Hi, Max Gelber, George Washington University. I haven't read the report or the document, but I see here that among the the reasons the birth policy violation is number 113. But then when you go back to the demographic information, there's only nine percent women uh, are interned based on the 311. So Who's getting in turn for violating birth policies? Some of you want to explain. Who's not? And are some people uh, going to different areas of detention or being assigned to a non-detention detention center? Are they yeah. under house arrest? Let's see if you could explain this. It's a good question. I uh, from this uh, 314 detainees. Like I think more than, like I think five or four are female. Most of them are male. 311. Yeah. Oh. And yeah, about 311, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, from that uh, document, uh, I can tell that all of them are in the same place. Those uh, four uh, female uh, detainees are in number two detention center, number two re-education camp. I think the number two re-education camp is fe like mostly uh, uh, like female re Most women are in inside there, but this uh, uh, I think like uh, we need to study more. I think the female is, is in concentrated in different place, not in that the, the document showed four detention center, four re-education camp. Maybe they are in different uh, re-education camp. So this document didn't mention that because of they are not in in this four re-education camp. Maybe they are somewhere, somewhere else. Thank you. From the internees, if, yeah. hi, Max, thank you for your question. Um, if, uh, excuse me, let me restart. So of the 311 detainees that we counted, we found, yes, this, uh, 114, I believe, who were in turn for uh, birth control policy or family planning policy violations, vast majority of them men. And in many cases, their women, their their women, excuse me, their wives would be listed in the family circle, um, and often not punished, not interned, or taken away for the same um, violation or the same reason. So there's not always a whole lot more that we can say about that. But don't forget at the same time that people on the outside, and especially women, since it's mostly men who are interned are still subject to very insidious forms of uh, political, ideological re-education. They might be on the outside, but there's a lot going on on the outside as well that they're still subject to. Very much agreeing with this. Um, about 90 or 91% of those in, shown as interned in the document are men, and are being targeted, and the men are taken also, uh, they're being held responsible. So if, for example, a woman a wife wore a veil, the assumption is that it's the husband's responsibility. Yeah. And uh, the same for birth control. So it's very much targeting men and husbands and household heads, obviously, who traditionally are in charge in Muslim cultures, also weaker culture, um, but also very much the target because they are obviously uh, juicier targets for the state, being social influencers, and obviously many acts of resistance are being perpetrated by males. Did I, did I leave something out of your question? Uh, no, just a quick follow-up comment question would be that there could be companion documentation or something that the document did not capture that could tell us more about the women and their family circles and how they weren't accounted for in, in these kind of documents. Well, um, a lot of secondary documents that I have and I published in November indicates that um, the internment campaign has left a lot of households with uh, single mothers. 
Mm -hmm. well, it says no labor force in the household raising for poverty. So, uh, and uh, all the other evidence that we have clearly indicates that males who are targeted for internment and are literally missing at home. Hi, uh, Shelley Han with the Fair Labor Association. Um, we've been using very similar terms like a training center, detention center, um, internment camp. In this case, what are we talking about? Is there and is there a difference um, in the center, the Zhongxin? Are they are they the same things? And what does it mean for um, the prospect of potential forced labor in any of those centers? Yes, thank you. So. The, the re-education facilities mentioned in the document are almost entirely labeled centers or education and training centers, which is short for vocational training internment centers or camps. Um, who, by definition, will lead into labor, i.e. forced labor? Um, yeah, very few other facilities are mentioned, and the likelihood of that is because this is about a verdict for release for the next stage. And a lot of, if you read my report, um, a lot of the release verdicts specifically mention labor, and many specifically mention industrial part. You also saw that on the slide by Elise Henderson. And um, those, are, those are the camps from which people are being released outside the internment system. And so those are the ones to look out for in connection with forced labor. And so the document, to answer, I guess, your question from a big picture perspective, has very, very interesting implications for forced labor. And we could do follow-up studies, actually, on it. Great. I'll jump in here before taking more questions. For those who'd like to go ahead and read Adrian's own paper and haven't found it yet, you just need to Google Adrian Zenz Journal of Political Risk. And would you like to give us the exact title of this analysis? Yeah, the, um, the Caracax list is in the title, so, okay. yeah. If you it's, it's about dissecting the anatomy of Beijing's internment campaign. But. If you just Google Adrian Zan's Caracax list, you'll get a lot of media coverage. If you want to look at his own uh, published analysis, be sure to look for the Journal of Political Risk. Uh, as we said, UHRP's report is on our website, uhrp.org. Uh, and it looks like we have two or three more questions. We'll take them together and then see how many, how much time we have for answers. So who, uh, right here, we had a, a comment, a question? Sure. Um, hi, my name's Paul Johnson. I just found the issue on, on independence. Um, forgive me if this was spoken about before, but just the question of facial recognition technology. Um, it, it, I wonder if, if there has been some discussion about the uh, deployment and the implication of facial recognition technology. Great. And do we have another? Do we have another hand here? Yes. Go ahead, Ashley. Oh. Okay. I actually have two questions. One is about the coronavirus, um, specifically for Dr. Zenz and uh, Mr. Ayu. Are you concerned about the spread of the virus in the camps and what those implications might be? And then the second is sort of more policy-oriented question. Um, Ms. Anderson sort of gave us like what we should take away from all this data. What do you think policymakers, especially the U.S. government, should take away from this in terms of its foreign policy with China? Thank you very much. And we will take one more question um, here in the middle. Great, why don't we take them in, in reverse order, and, and Abdullah, do you want to talk about children and their experience growing up in East Turkestan today? It's very painful, I know, father of children himself. Go ahead. Um, uh, let me tell you something is very, like, uh, heartbreaking. 
In that document, they mentioned that four kids in um, Wuhan right now without the parents. Three, no, three kids. Mother arrested, and there's no mention where is the father, but three kids in Wuhan, and the one is uh, five, another is nine, another is uh, 14 years old. This document mentioned the uh, three kids in Wuhan, but didn't mention what are they doing. Just written Navy, it means that in, um, in, in inland China, it means that they, uh, they, they mentioned that they are in Wuhan. And I, I concern coronavirus, I concern their three kids' life. What are they doing? Who taking care of them? And uh, about this, like, uh, uh, education, that part, in uh, Hotan is the first place restricted Uyghur completely. It's in 2000, uh, 2016, uh, 2016 uh, June. And then, uh, in 2017, September, uh, so-called Xinjiang uh, administration restricted Uyghur. Hotel is the first place restricted Uyghur. So uh, those kids, where are they? They are in, uh, depend on uh, my interview, in uh, people in the like, Uyghur diaspora in uh, Turkey, they are in like uh, kids center. Like, uh, the name is very beautiful, Hey, Xin Yuan like love uh, kindergarten, and those uh, like kids without parents, they are living in love kindergarten, and but uh, depend on the, the, the like uh, TikTok video we have watched, they are not in, in love, they are crying, actually, without the parents. Thank you. Great, and then we have a, a question on coronavirus and the thoughts about uh, that given the camp system. Yes, um, obviously the virus situation is of great concern. Um, in regards to Xinjiang, of course, we have a limited number of official cases, uh, no idea about the real situation. Um, in regards to the camps, I think we should be a little bit, I think for Uyghurs this must be an extremely emotional and crazy topic. Um, from a sort of slightly rational perspective, one would say that Xinjiang is not as badly affected as uh, areas closer to Wuhan or Hubei. The camps tend to be somewhat more isolated places. They are not typically in city centers, and there's typically not a lot of coming and going in terms of uh, bringing uh, people visiting or bringing the virus in. Um, or it is visiting, but it's restricted. But of course, uh, these are so-called sitting ducks. These are highly concentrated, very unhygienic regions and areas. Um, given how that the coronavirus is much more easily transmissible than what was originally thought, I think it's impossible to make any prediction about it. But um, before we have any more evidence, I'm not sure that we should um, quickly move into doomsday scenarios either. So, but that's just a very unemotional uh, <laughs> response to a, a very, very uh, loaded and difficult topic. So I think we, we just have very little information on the situation. The last two questions were about facial recognition. How does that integrate with, or how is that touched on by, the, what does the document tell us about that? And then also U.S. government foreign policy implications. Who would like to take those? Yeah, I've not seen any direct evidence of the document talking about facial recognition. Yeah, yeah in that document, uh, it's, it mentioned that Yi Hua Tu Tung Shui Yuan, it means that the uh, integrated um, uh, joint operation system. Uh, it's Yiti Hua, it means that like you have uh, your pictures and you have very every uh, information about you. And Yiti Hua Tisung, it means that the like, uh, uh, integrated that system uh, suggested that this one is uh, dangerous. Why, how can they describe, how can they decide you are dangerous or not? Like you have picture in that uh, like system and if you go the street, uh, like um, like very quickly or like your uh, faces are not very normal, like very angry or something, 
and the, those camera catch your picture and send to the center. And the center decided you are dangerous and send message to police and you will be arrested. That's, that's related. The ET Hua Tuesong it means that the ET, that the, the system uh, have your picture, the normal picture, but if your picture is not normal in that system, it means that you are a danger. And we have you know, the guy who worked for this integrated system and he, he participated, developed the system. He's somewhere in the world, in the outside, and uh, he can prove this. I have seen the picture in, in, her, in his hand and he participated that like someone is normal if you like this, but if you are angry, it means that dependent on the system, you are like uh, three category, the blue one and the yellow one and the red one. The, like my face is blue one. If I'm nervous, it's become red. And if you are nervous in front of the camera, like, like uh, the surveillance camera, that system will uh, remind the police that this one is danger. Then the police will call you and arrest you. That's, that's related to the, the like, uh, face recognition system. Yeah. Okay. And Elise, would you like to give a quick line on uh, UHRP's call to action to the United States government? Uh, sure, I will try. If I can also add a um, just one quick comment to that. I think one thing to keep in mind about the facial recognition technology, AI, the apps, um, in some senses, there's very sophisticated policing and very sophisticated data, data gathering going on. But this document, in which I, like Adrian, did not find anything directly, and our research team did not find anything directly related to the facial recognition technologies, um, we can see the sophistication in some senses, but we can also see that it's a very crude system. <laughs> and it's a crude system because it relies on a tremendous amount of human power that is um, easily going to lead to errors and things like that. So I just to, if maybe that's a helpful takeaway. I thought I would add it in. Um, and okay, so um, US government, it's an excellent question. Thank you, Ajinor, for the question. Um, what the US government should take away, I mean, I would reiterate on one level, I think keeping in mind the personal level is really important, these are just 311 primary individuals, right, with thousands more mentioned who are clearly being surveilled and monitored, and I think that should help us to understand, and lawmakers and policymakers considering this issue, to keep in mind the scope and the scale of what is happening and the fact that lives are at stake, but also certain values are at stake of, you know, freedom, democracy, human rights, and fundamental human dignity, and that the United States government needs to do whatever it can. We need to do whatever we can to uphold those values of human rights and human dignities, human dignity and not sacrificing them to um, certain political, trade, other economic concerns, right? And so one way toward that is through the passage of the Uyghur Act, of course, as we all know. S-178, talk to your senators, right? It's, it's back in the Senate now. Talk to your senators, encourage anyone who might be on the fence um, talk to the Senate, is it Committee on Foreign Relations? Write letters, pick up the phone and call. Um, but yes, human lives, human dignity, and fundamental values are at stake, and we must act. Thank you. I'd also like to welcome our, all of our audience to attend um, an upcoming policy forum, also co-sponsored uh, by our two organizations, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, as well as the uh, committee, International Committee to End Transplant Abuse in China. Uh, in this very room on March 10th, we'll be presenting groundbreaking research, research-based uh, presentation on organ procurement issues in China and extrajudicial killing, confronting the evidence is the title of the report, and you'll see that uh, out there. Please speak with Christina or any of us if you'd like to be on the invitation list. And I want to thank uh, everyone for being here. Uh, I hope you'll also join me in thanking our panelists for speaking today.